of those key parts, we're going to have a problem. So this is why we've come into existence. We're just starting off by uh, uh, writing, trying to write a set of rules about the best practices. How do we, in, in a good way, offer our help to a, a, a package developer that uh, may want help but may not even want to give up ownership? You may want to keep ownership but may be a, a little too stressed with what's going on. So in the open source world, uh, let's go to our repo. We are, uh, we're, we're documenting what we're doing here. We have a reasonably large team, perhaps 10 uh, people participating in regular meetings every two weeks. And we're covering some very basic stuff to begin with, you know, like what are our rules on licensing? Uh, how should we encourage people to follow you know, assembler versioning? Because when we adopt a package, we're going to have no idea what state it's in. We're going to have some rules. Yeah, we must have a repo. It must be kind of critical. It must be something people are using. It must have lots of downloads. And, you know, there must be a valid reason why we're taking it over. So we're going to talk a little bit more. I'm going to hand over to Emily here. So these are some of our goals. Um, we obviously want to connect and get feedback from some of the package maintainers out there. Um, once we figure out kind of like what we're doing, we want to discuss what that work looks like, um, build maybe some tools for the community. Um, some of that has sort of gotten started, some ideas. And then we'll, we're going to need to evangelize what we're doing um, to everybody. So people that might be interested in this work, obviously us. Hi. Um, some, you know, the node collaborators. Um, packet maintainers and project collaborators uh, were some ideas of uh, who we thought might be super interested in this. And this is like a basic agenda of some topics that we can um, talk about. Of course, we can delve into whatever people find uh, might be useful as well. So. So we maintenance. Um, these, this is the drafts, obviously. Uh, so if you're curious about what we've been working on and what we've started, where, where we're at, um, this is a good place to start. And I'm going to hand it off. <laughs> okay. Uh, the first uh, idea that we uh, bring to the community is the uh, support field in the package JSON. Uh, he uh, it aims to uh, tell to people that use uh, those library um, what's the kind of support the uh, maintainer or, or the organization want to uh, bring uh, to the community. For example, target none, it means uh, uh, take your own risk or uh, response best effort I'm on vacation bye bye or of course regular uh, seven uh, for example so in all the day you uh, have a support team that reply to issues for example uh, backing this module is uh, uh, a hobby uh, script so beware and there are uh, other um, values that you can uh, put in that uh, JSON, of course, and okay. Okay, and for this uh, stuff, we build a, a support validator, a client tool that uh, simply check uh, the correctness of those uh, information, for example. Or we are uh, adding a new command to add to uh, your package JSON these uh, fields. Uh, this could be uh, useful for companies that need to, to choose a module. Uh, and must uh, be conscious about the uh, support of this uh, 
Yeah. I, I was just going to say, can I add two cents? So, how many people here already use the, the, the license field of the parking space in terms of figuring out places to look at? Well, that's a pretty good number. How many people think that looking at the support that's provided and information in the parking space might be something you would use in a similar way? Okay, so that, that's good feedback. Like, we were thinking that, you know, by providing more information and some of the tools to help validate it, It'll let end users make additional choices. And I guess James has a question. So um, the license field uses the SPDX uh, format standard um, for this, uh, with the intention being to basically provide a standard uh, format for the identifier so other people can introduce their own. As part of what we've documented, we've documented an initial set. Uh, you know, here's the initial you know, three letter acronyms, what they mean. And the idea would be for now, this repo would be the source of that. People can PR an additional one. Okay, so they can do so at least the 12 or It's time extensible. Time. We've tried not to make it like there's no ordering implied. So basically if you want something completely new, you PR it in and that's something that people can then understand what you and your community can do. Great. And then the other, the, the one other question there would be, I assume that it's part of this repo, there, there'll be a standard text uh, uh, boilerplate text for each of those identifiers. Yeah, identifiers. yeah, we could actually. Yeah, maybe we'll, we'll maybe we'll go through, but maybe after we can jump into that and, and show with that in more detail afterwards after you guys go through the rest of it. Okay, okay, Miles. Oh, um, so this is very similar to something I've been personally thinking about for a while. Uh, which is that like uh, software licenses offer this really amazing signal that you can just see MIT or Apache and it tells you a lot of what you need to know about like the legality of it, but not a lot about the maintenance, not a lot about the support contract. And when we think about open source today, like there's the OSI definition of open source and that's just about the license. That's not about the maintenance at all. And that's very ambiguous and that's where a lot of problems come from. Um, the two challenges I can see with using the package JSON format for this, and I'm not saying that it's not the right place to do it. Um, one would be that it doesn't have from immediately looking at a repo unless GitHub built on top of this metadata, the same signal that a license file does. And one of the things that I, I, I've been using the term social source as an idea of like what this could be, um, but like in the same way that we have a license, could there be a file or three letters that you put in, like how, how is a way that we could have the same signal that doesn't require having to go through and look through a bunch of metadata to parse it out? And yes. we agree. Yeah, um, yeah I think if, if, we agree, if we agree on the values, then tax tracing might be one way to deliver it, but coming up with other ones, like yeah, you think a file in the repo and we say put this file in with separate JSON or a different port totally makes sense. Yeah, and, and one of the things I thought about there was kind of like the way the, uh, oh God, the CC license, so you like CC, BY, OY, like it's just like these series of acronyms that kind of tell you everything you need to know. The, the other small concern that I would have with the package JSON, and this is like, you probably should just ignore me, um, but is we parse the package JSON in Node every single time you require a module, at least in the scope of a module, as part of our resolution algorithm. And so I am not hugely in favor of throwing lots more metadata into every single package JSON all throughout the tree. Now this may just be like a micro optimization, but like, cause it is a pattern that people use all over the place. Um, but my intuition is if there's other places we can put it that may be preferable, but like that's a micro optimization, and maybe maybe you should ignore me. No, no, you're right, and we'd be delighted to get to the point where we have so many packages we're maintaining that we could be a problem for the ecosystem. Uh, you know, but dream dream of, of, of getting that that we're like and so. And and while while about getting the mic, just think about we were wanting to get to the point where like an npm init would add this in for you with default value. So when you get the right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Related issue to the previous is what I was starting to think here is what happens when people start to, you know, realize that 
they don't feel like they want to maintain a package anymore. Because at that point, if this data is in the package JSON, it would effectively require them to push out a new release with a new version in order to push out the package JSON data. And this may be too much of an ask for someone who's effectively giving up on maintaining a package. So what would be a great thing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. I might have uh, it, it effectively, yeah, you're right. If it, 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 it can entirely well be considered a, a center major change here. And at that point, yeah, asking for that is, is not just, just not going to get you the update. So what actually you're talking about is the package maintenance team not being able to support. Because what we're really talking about is when we, we go out and on board and adopt a project, it's really it's going to be a team of developers we're evangelizing for that will actually be doing this, not just a developer. Right, but I guess I'll, I'll this this may be something that the team would do when we adopt it. But I'm in my mind, we're still going to ask everybody to put this in there. Yeah. yeah. But I, I I still think that if you're in the case where you've like totally just said I'm doing nothing, then maybe that's something like the package maintenance team might have a role in finding like this module has clearly been abandoned. We'll, we'll adopt it to the point where you do this one PR to change that. If you're, an, if you're a module owner and you've, you just don't want to have anybody bug you anymore, I'm hoping eventually it's worthwhile for you to do that one little thing because it may cut down on like whether you get issues, whether people are complaining and back banging on your door, you can say, no, look, I said it's unsupported. You know, it's a, Part of it is like if there's a mismatch in expectations, or the users think this is a highly well-maintained module. On the other hand, somebody, the owner thinks this is just a hobby that I do on the side. You have no support. Communicating that, if you close the gap, then both people should be a little bit happier because you can point to this and say, well, look, this is my expectation and there's no reason you shouldn't have the same expectation. So I can, I can see that in the case where the module the owner just doesn't do anything, but it's really hard to do anything in that case, right? So I'm not as worried. Uh, I just want to add that to all the points that were just discussed, that even validates more of not having it in the package of JSON file. Um, because yes, changing the package JSON file might require to republish, uh, but putting it in the repo may not in a different file, and also less effort or you know not in the path of critical uh, access and to. Uh, Miles point, yeah, like there's performance issues impacted by that. And you know, speaking as a person who has to actually store all the packages on the world and right. actually deal with the cost of that, let's not make them fatter. But a critical thing to us is just like NPM audit or tools that can today, after you install, parse through all the files and figure out whether your licenses are okay. We need the data to be there once you've done your install, right? So I don't know where else other than the package JSON gets installed uh, on that. And that's kind of probably what I'm indicating, like having a separate file that is dedicated for that is right, probably they, better for tooling creators or companies that happen to own tools to know where to look for them but how beyond. Do you get those, how do you get those files and all that? You're, you're effectively defining the specification. Um, it's not that hard to get. If you replace the, the support with a, a URL to the place where the support's defined, I, I kind of I can't agree with this. Yeah, kind of agree with the point because support can change when the code doesn't change. In fact, that's really it's particularly likely when you abandon things. You published it, and it's not so much that it's too much work, but the reality is that like all of the versions lost support at the same time. Not just the latest version. Yeah. The version before is also not supported. So if somebody has an npm install of a slightly later version because it's locked in a package right. JSON, which is everybody. Sorry? Yeah, so the earlier version, locked in the package JSON, it'll still, you know, have this word, you know, best paid, you know, anyhow. Right so I, yeah, um, GitHub, GitHub already supports looking for a support.md file in, in, in the repo, but, uh, as a way of uh, some of this information. So it's like, there's, there's already... There's but not all modules have GitHub repos. I, I like the idea of it just being like, I want you to go from the package JSON to the information, but I quite like the idea of like, it can just be a URL, which you host wherever. Oh, or you want to make that file, pretty easy. To the file, right? yeah, so yeah, reference yeah. to the file. Yeah, it's yeah, not, that, sure. it's not that all things have to have you know, a repo. It's just yeah. a support that a file there. Right? It's part of you know, it's part of your, it's part In your, of your yeah. That could be a good one yes, that could be like. Because it is your main. Sure. It's part of, yeah. We could say. 
as part of what you publish as your module, you include this file. That would be worth, yeah. That's, but I do like the part where you can change it separately. So, yeah. Okay. I, I, uh, I'd also be curious, um, I mean, with, with support other feed, like if you have to be building out a parsable, like the, the benefit of this is it's parsable, right? right. Um, and support, like oh, we could do YAML front matter, but that's gross. Um, I might just do that same section in the support. Document. So then maybe support.json. Like, right, yeah, support.json. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, it, I, I, I think that saying we shouldn't put things in package.json, like, you know, I, I, the parsing, parsing thing is a problem, uh, especially with what I'm about to say. It's become standard to do that, right? That's what everyone does in our ecosystem. And I, I think it's, it's ignoring this the state of the world to ask to not do that. Like that's how things are expected. And um, I, I think like if you wanted to do that, we'd have to go and like define package JSON as a spec and say anything else in this is invalid and throw, uh, which we're not going to do. Uh, so I, I do think it's a little bit of a like it's a, a little bit going around the rest of the world uh, if we don't do this. So like the state of the ecosystem. Um, and I, I think that you know this is something that people can very easily build in their personal CLIs and like. When I'm npm installing, I can also run this other npx script that will, or another package that will throw if any of the files that end up in my node modules uh, have something that I'm not willing to use. Um, I, I think having a parsable in that very central spot is normal at this point. The package JSON though is not really the only place that has package specific metadata. The, the npm repository uh, already does deprecation notices. And I'm not sure, yet. I think it's got a couple of different, the disk tag itself that you're installing, that, that's part of the package specific version independent metadata. And that might not be an inappropriate place for this sort of information as well. But that might require sort of defining what does an NPM package repository look like. So well, one more thought, it's a challenge, might be scope creep. So again, you can tell me to stop. Uh, relying heavily on package JSON makes this an extremely JavaScript specific solution. I think that this movement that we're talking about here <coughs> is as important as open source, is as important as licenses and we really should be talking about solutions that are language agnostic. Um, and yes, in the same way that there's a license field that can refer to a thing like CCBYNO, whatever, um, the artifact that, that codifies this at length, I think if possible, should be platform independent um, and you know, something that has that signal I was, I was talking about before. Um, and it is very possible that that is not the scope of what your team is trying to accomplish. Um, but I do think that this is very important. It's something that's missing from the programming ecosystem. It is burning out tons of developers in every single community. I think it's something that we could, as a foundation, approach the OSI about and be like, hey, let's work on this together. So I, I would challenge you to perhaps think at a bigger scale of influence and effect, and that the package JSON may actually be limiting our ability to, to scale this up. For, license, for licenses today, we do both, right? Like it's in the package. You can have a license field in there as well as the license file. But here's the, if the package JSON says license, but then the actual license file. Yeah. Like the package JSON is metadata, but it's it's very possible that the package JSON has the incorrect metadata in there, and the license file in the repo is a different license. And I firmly, not a lawyer hat on, I'm pretty sure that the physical license in the folder would likely trump that. Um, so I just yeah. I don't know that it's the source of truth, but yet it is what we write a lot of tools relying on that being a reliable source of source of truth. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Too, right. So, so uh, I just want to echo what Miles is saying in terms of importance to the open source community as well. If you don't have to solve for that, maybe we solve for JavaScript, OpenJS, and then introduce that later. 
Um, I just want to also echo the, or <coughs> annotate Miles' points with referencing um, the GitHub use cases or the GitHub examples when you create a repo and it tells you, hey, you should have a readme file, right. and you should have this. Like that is becoming a pseudo standard almost. Yeah. Uh, likewise, and the Linux community, like a readme file, and like capitalize and a license file, and Linux capitalize, like those are also semi standard, semi or pseudo standards. Uh, and in the web, in the browser world, the dot well known uh, is also another example of that. Uh, the dot well known is also interesting because it's just freeform, but as long as the dot well known is the free text, so you just have as many files in there and various things, but there's a manifest. I'm just referencing those as points for I also did want to add to, to Miles and kind of back that up. Um, in a previous role, I had access to a lot of the entire registry's licenses and compiled them and deduced them um, and like ran the numbers. And there there are a lot of typos in package JSON files uh, and a lot of weird things that you uh, wouldn't expect to be in the license field uh, of a package JSON. So like, yes, I 100% agree with that, Miles. Um, slightly different question. Um, have you figured out how do you relate to the in the Rictus projects of the OpenJS Foundation? In the what project? I don't think it necessarily relates directly to whether you're emeritus or something else. It's it's more about like if you could be an emeritus project but still have active support, right? Like it's it's not about we're adding new features, we're adding this. It's more like if you if you re re report an issue. What kind of response can you expect? You know, is there is it going to be like never or on our best effort or well, we usually try to respond within seven days or and and the 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 target actually is around what versions of Node you're supporting. So that's actually a little bit Node specific. So I'll go back and say we should absolutely try and generalize and you know we don't want to limit ourselves there. I think we should put something in place we think will work there and then go and say well this is actually a broader issue but like a working example is good. The target one is about like these are the LTS releases we support. We target supporting all LTS releases or just the latest LTS release or all known releases, right? And that's still an emeritus project could choose any one of those options, right? It's about as a consumer, when might I have to change or update? Like because the very next release current comes out, that's all I support, so I gotta do that. Right? Actually, related to question, how is that actually different from the engine view? Engine, I think, says specific versions of Node, right? So maybe there's some overlap there. I have to think about. This was more like you know you could say L the one we we can look at the things we defined, but like LTS was like we're targeting supporting all active LTS releases, no one particular version. But like if today it's eight and ten, and tomorrow it's ten and twelve, it means ten and twelve when. So the timing may be the thing that affects it. And, and then the backing one is like for an emeritus one again. I think we still have foundation, which sort of says like, what kind of backing is there behind this? Is it like one person in their basement who just does it for fun, which is the hobby one, or is there like a business or an organization that? Well, it, it's it's not like you can choose one module versus the other based on that, but it's more information like a license. I just wanted to add because uh, what Miles was outlining. Uh, is actually, I think, the pitch of what Tidelift is doing. So when you go in and claim a package in Tidelift, you can indicate in there which releases are obsolete, LTS, maintained, whatnot. And the whole model is that from the corporate side, uh, you know, we would ingest Tidelift's data stream that flows back into paying the package managers, uh, package maintainers, and we get the data of what's supported and reports and all of that, right? So they're I believe they're they already have that implemented and they are also working with OSI or talking to OSI about it. So it might be worth chatting with them and seeing if there's something integrated there. Do you know contacts or who? I uh, personally I wasn't willing to talk to them, but I can I can certainly look up uh, Yeah, if you can find us in contacts who might be interested in talking to us, we should reach out to them. We have also evaluated uh, to collaborate with uh, Greenkeeper, for example, uh, for adding new uh, feature and new um, uh, automation, let's say. So uh, we have started to talk with them, uh, but not build something useful right now.
So looking at that image, I noticed that uh, all the things are uppercase, all the target response uh, backing and everything else is lowercase. Um, is, is the uppercase mandated or is it? Uh, In terms of, yeah, we just, we just made them all uppercase. Okay. Like, like, like even the name name property, the, the value has to be lowercase. Um, so like, I, I, that's total like semantics and like small things, but like the rest, a lot of the rest of this, it ends up being lowercase by default. Is that something that could be changed? Absolutely. Like okay. if there's a reason for them to be lowercase. Yeah. I think it sort of came from in a lot of cases, if we have short forms or acronyms, mm -hmm. those tend to be capitalized. Yeah. But it's nothing more than that. Okay. I was just curious about that because it like stood out to me from my and my experience. Right. 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 Yeah, like I don't know what do they do for licenses. Uh, it's the acronym, but like none and best effort aren't acronyms. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, I think uh, some might be lowercase. Like it's like a not like MIT is an acronym, but if something's not, I don't know if it necessarily is uppercase. Okay. So we just like we might look at that more carefully yeah. and just be consistent. Thanks, guys. Yeah. This. Uh, uh, is also in draft. Yeah, <laughs> we, we can fix it. Yeah. Everything. <coughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, what's next? Next, uh, we have no, no, yeah. Uh, then we have tried also to list all the uh, criteria uh, to uh, understand which uh, package. Uh, need to be um, helped uh, first. So uh, we have uh, tried to uh, recap uh, all the um, a long, a long, a long issue uh, that has been discussed, and we uh, finally build this uh, this list. So uh, what do you think? We have for sure the number of downloads, the module. Uh, the um, the number of the uh, downloads of the dependency tree, for example, uh, there is um, a package that uh, um, is useful for Express that uh, is uh, uh, used by uh, Express itself and, and not directly, for example. So. That it was tricky. Um, how many uh, packages depends on the uh, on the module? How uh, the number of the dependency? In this case, for example, uh, less dependencies could be uh, more uh, easy to um, fix that module. Uh, we of course uh, evaluated all, also the the tests. Uh, against the node version, because this could be uh, uh, more secure to um, uh, help that uh, that code base in order to don't break, of course, the um, the API. If the dependencies are updated or not, if there are also uh, deprecated dependencies, uh, if they um, Repo have many issues open, or uh, of course, if uh, it's uh, maintained by the company, and this is uh, not, we don't have an answer for this um, question yet because we don't know if we want freely help companies in this case, for example. Uh, uh, of course, the last activities. Uh, the maintainer are uh, working on that uh, uh, module or not. Most recent, uh, it's, yeah, it's a plus. So I, I think that this list could be more uh, long. Do you have uh, other ideas? Um, are you familiar with npm.io? There's a, a lot of really good metadata that comes from that. Um, 
um, that has things like uh, how many um, commits were made between releases, uh, whether or not there's a readme file, whether or not there's a license file. A lot of the information from, from that project might be helpful here too. Thank you. I, personally, I don't think that I have uh, listened uh, that uh, the site first, so we can investigate. I was just curious what you meant when you said that you want to help. Do you mean like do you want to reach out and ask them also maybe for feedback about this process too? They, I mean, I guess I mean the point is to help them to be like, hey, we want to help you make sure you don't burn out or someone will take care of your package when you're done. Correct. Uh, first, next slide. Yeah. Uh, first, we have identified some pilot packages that uh, uh, help us to help them, let's say. Uh, so we can try uh, the tools that we, uh, we, we are going to build, or uh, also workflow and process. Uh, and then bring all this know-how to the uh, um, entire community in order to uh, help uh, like uh, without any um, bias, let's say. But for sure, we have to, uh, in the first step, we need to um, go uh, with little steps, let's say. The pilot packages is the first. They uh, find the list of all the uh, packages. Uh, and we don't know how many, for example. Uh, but without uh, um, prioritize our friends or something like that, because we want to be uh, agnostic, let's say. Uh, so we uh, try to list those rules in order to, to find potential um, maintainers that need help. Okay. I just want to add a, a couple things to that is, so there's, there's two parts. One, we want to figure out how to let people and companies who care help maintainers. So, if there's businesses who really depend on a whole bunch of modules, it's a risk to their business if those modules are having problems keeping up to date, being maintained. And so ideally, you know, some of the things we've talked about is like tools, which Matt has looked at to say, help a business understand, here are all the modules you depend on. And then hopefully, how do you turn that into like a business case and turn it to say, let's go out and make contributions to these modules because it's in our own business. So that there's sort of that angle of not just the package maintenance team going out and helping, but trying to help close the gap so that people who are depending and get the benefit can help. And then separately, you know, we got quite a, a good number of people who sort of joined the team saying, how can I help? And we're trying to build like a smaller backlog list that says, if you're interested in helping, here are some things that package maintainers, you know, of, and that's where the, the previous one is like, we can't do that for all models, but critical models. Here's some places where you can get involved and help is useful because a lot of the time people are like, well, I don't know how to start, right? So it's like to build a backlog that says, here's how you can start and a bit of a team that can help people who want to get involved, maybe bootstrap them or whatever. So that's what we mean by the help side. So on the other When you're, this on. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, so when you uh, are saying to, to have people help, do you mean help this? team like figure out these processes or tools or do you mean help like the maintain packages that are becoming no longer maintained right it's to help the actual package themselves so but it'll help the actual yeah like package I mean, maintainers. we obviously want people to help you, put this yeah, stuff in, okay. in in place but like, the end goal uh, I see. Okay, is no. to try and get more help for the end like solve the problem right like yeah so you're trying to curate a list of package maintainers who you are willing to try to get help for right exactly like they're they, they, we think that it's important for the ecosystem, important for the success yes. of Node. They're interested, and and we can help build a concrete list that then other people, as opposed to like, if you just say, hey, everybody come in and join my project, it's it's it may become that that's actually harder. And we're hoping by having some an organized group kind of figure out the way those things work, yeah. we can make that actually better for the package. It's a, it's a hard problem, but that's kind of the goal. Or, I really respect that a lot because I think that one of the things about volunteer, um, voluntary like associations and programs is that 
it's hard to get started without a human like to interface and to like kind of hold your hand and like uh, uh, encourage you even right. like yeah uh, for the first few steps so this idea that that you're going to provide a human interface to people who want to get started maintaining or want to help maintain packages i think this is super cool so good to hear yeah. Uh, there, so on, on the previous slide, on the terms of the criteria we had on there, whether it's supported by a company, um, the, you know, I, I, I'm, I would just stress that really needs to be tightly watched. For the money. And you can see this as being a vector. The, the company gets a module out there, and they decide they don't want to support it anymore. And they basically rely on the community just to kind of take over free support for something that they put out there that they're still ever being benefited from. So, you know, whether they want to help or not, I, I think you actually want to emphasize on that. If they, are they the sole supporters of this thing? And are they basically abandoning it, you know, expecting the, the, uh, the ecosystem just to, you know, uh, keep it going? The other, the other thing that we, um, we need to watch here is when does an open source module become a company supported module? Right, so when an, indiv you know, if an individual is uh, uh, working on something and they get hired by a company, Right, um, and that company is making it, is, is uh, uh, getting commercial benefit out of that module, right? Would, you know, is it still a, you know the ecosystem? Or are we still going to be providing support for that? So when, you know, when when do we pull the support back when there's a when there's a company involved? Yes, th these are the things we are discussing. That that's uh, we're getting we're getting that down. So it is early days, yeah. Um, a lot of the work we're doing here now is, uh, is perhaps not as exciting as the actual work of <laughs> writing code, but unless we provide a framework for all of these uh, people to operate within, then we won't be able to do this. And we know eventually we're going to be right. The, the ecosystem is getting very large, and we're seeing some people that, that are getting reaching the points in their life, as I said, where perhaps they can't do all the things they thought they could do when they were a little bit younger. Uh, they have some different objectives, and these are now critical for not just for individuals and hobbyists, but for very, very large corporations. But uh, unless we have a framework for uh, handling this, we won't be able to engage those other entities. And it's really those other entities that will have to be engaged eventually. Yeah. Um, so one of the first candidates is a package that I inherited long ago, which is uh, MQTT.js. This is long, long ago. I inherited this between 2012, 2013. Did a lot of nice talk, conference talks about it and so on. Did a lot of nice internal things demo. Then my job, I changed what I was doing. And I'm not using it as part of my job at all. And uh, uh, right now the repo, I just pull, we just pushed a major major version out, so things are not super bad. The problem, main problem, is that it has 130, 140 issues open of people asking for for anything, and there's no absolute zero time to in a, even like start to tackle it. There is there are several issues in the repo itself that, um, for example, we are tied to an old version of Mocha. Well, we're not tied, but we run Mocha with some legacy flags, um, essentially because uh, the tests are super flaky. So essentially, it's impossible to say that something was is passing or not. <laughs> so this makes doing any work very, very hard. Uh, you need to run the test several times and say, oh, OK. I'm confident enough this is not breaking anybody. Um, there are several reasons for that, and because it's a very old code base, it grows inorganically, or, or you know, it grow with sprints of people working on it, wanting certain features, and then moving away very quickly. And uh, you know, so just want to say that yeah, that's a target. It's currently used by uh, Microsoft, IBM. Uh, Probably Google, I don't know, I need to check that. For IoT SDK, um, um, this is my shaming moment. So uh, WeChat as well, this is recommended by WeChat in, in China. And uh, there is issue being posted in Chinese. 
So just so that you know, okay. Um, like a lot of, it's been used in a lot of fun places, uh, but more of it's part of the dependencies of Node-RED, which is an OpenJS project. And yeah, that is the situation. This is basically a tiny group of people that's, you know, trying to keep up. There was one volunteer to implement support for MQTT5, which is, whoa, information, but still, it's uh, essentially uh, it's very, it's very hard. There are certain issues that need to be fixed, very hard issues related to connection, as somebody has, there was somebody that did a fantastic, well, I don't know who did the work on the, um, uh, yeah, somebody posted an analysis, a text analysis of all the issues that have been open. So somebody did this amazing tool that given a bunch of issues, it tells you what are the key topics. And one of the key topics is connection management. And I know perfectly why people get freaked out about connection management, okay? And, you know, there are bugs there. They're not bugs, but, you know, fundamental issues in the library that, you know, if you need support of flying mode, so if you want support of flying mode, then you support reconnect. But then if you can connect, how do you distinguish the fact that you can connect versus the um, versus a, a server that's not there, okay? So that is kind of a, a fundamental issue in the library. Um, yeah, I uh, just want to say all of this, of the, all the problems, okay? And this is very typical, unfortunately. Um, Express, it's the major thing that the Express team is doing, is doing support requests. They are always asking for people to add them with support requests. The reason is this, what these two modules have in common, they are used by people new to that. So essentially they came by, a lot of people came by, oh, this just thing, I don't know anything about this just thing. I am, in case of um, MQTT, I'm just trying to get something up and running quickly on my Raspberry Pi or on server very, that I know nothing about all these technologies. And then they say, what is this unmessaged thing that I need to use? And how, you know, how do I deal with that? <laughs> it, it's a topic, you know, and, and that's kind of the bigger, the bigger, kind of the bigger issue. Now there is a lot of community work to be done most of the time, like create templates says, hey, if you have a problem about Node.js, like go there, <laughs> don't stay here. This is, you're not getting any help here, okay? Um, and stuff like that. If you post an issue in Chinese, I don't know, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Like, you know, that's, that's the thing. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, only one sentence. Uh, we build awesome badges. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, we need the support in the package JSON only for this. Okay, sure. So I guess really, you know, just to, just to end up that, you know, this is just some of our initial ideas. Um, you know, we want to figure out what works, what doesn't work. So we're working on best practices, but we also want to think about like tooling. Um, is there some common tooling that we can generate that helps package maintainers in the end? Obviously we don't want to tell anybody what they need to do, but in a lot of cases, if you have a best practice and a tool to back it up, like why not, right? Like if you have a reason to do something that's different, go for it. Um, but again, it's like trying to avoid everybody having to figure out some of these problems or things that can consume a lot of time every time over. So like Mateo mentioned, well, how do I deal with like questions that are like not related to my project? Well, maybe we can come up with a tool that helps you do that more easily or tools that, uh, you know, also in terms of tooling, like, you know, there's a bit of work to validate the, uh, the support level, but we want tools to help you generate those kinds of things. And so really it's just to say we have lots of other ideas and, and that's other things we'll be looking at in the future as well. I guess that's the end of our, oh, there we go. So, uh, the people are here, here today and, uh, there are quite a few more that attend the meetings regularly. Um, it will be a slow thing to start off with, and the first 
few packages we help out with will probably teach us an awful lot and a lot will change and many of the things that you've mentioned will probably you know come to fruition we'll change and we'll learn but uh, unless we do this you, we all know what will inevitably happen to the ecosystem so thank you everybody and I'll, I'll throw in one more thing before I ask questions just you know what we got a lot of really good feedback on the support uh, idea will incorporate that and our next step was to start like socializing that more broadly so if you can keep your eye on the repo and jump in to make sure we, we understood what your feedback was and incorporated it but that's you know sort of one of our main next steps is to try and start get that out there and figure out how we make it or make it a reality so I think I'm adding a question here crazy what question there's a meeting for Monday is that so uh, I, I, I can't make it. Okay, I'm gonna be in a plan. But yeah, like I'm gonna plan it unless somebody else, like I don't know, Mikhail can post it or depends on the time. Let me check. Okay. <laughs> it's that's a lot yeah, of no, that's a good idea. Sure. Yeah, and I guess that's a good point. Uh, Likely not. It's okay. Okay. I was gonna invite people. To well, I was gonna say, but two weeks from now we'll have another one every Monday. Sorry. Yeah. Every every Monday. Right. Every Monday we have one. Second Monday, three, Sorry, every three, second Monday. Every second Monday. Eastern Standard Time. Three p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have, we'd love to have more people come out. These are the kind of things we're talking about and thinking about. And if you can't do that, then it's all in GitHub. So contribute there too. But yeah, very good point. Well, enough further questions. Thank you, everybody. And. Uh, it's going to be a slow process to begin with, but once we get going, we, we know this is a reasonable approach to take to things that are critical to the ecosystem. And if anyone has any ideas, we're more than willing to, to listen. Thank you all for coming.